So welcome to the second part of Jewish sensibility in the architecture of Daniel Liebskin. Uh, Daniel Liebskin is a Polish-American architect uh, from Łódź, Poland. He is the son of uh, Holocaust survivors. Both his parents uh, were in the Holocaust and he himself uh, was born in Poland, but when he was 13, lived in a kibbutz in Israel. And then after that, he was on the last a boat that came from Israel to uh, New York as an immigrant. And his father was a, a factory worker and his mother was a factory worker. And so he came from the true immigrant uh, story to the United States. And last time we talked about his Holocaust museums, which are absolutely fantastic in terms of manipulating the space to get the emotions that he is looking for, but also teaching and allowing us to experience the Holocaust in ways that are just absolutely foundational. But while I spoke about his Holocaust thematic buildings before, he has a very open Jewish sensibility. Uh, Daniel Liebskin started as an academic architect, which means that he did not get his degree to make buildings. He got his degree in order to make utopian plans, which is understandable considering the kibbutz that he came from and how kibbutz is a very structured, planned use of land. And so he brought these lessons from the kibbutz of Judaism into his architecture. Now, he is one of the few Jewish architects that actually uses Jewish sensibility to guide his architectural principles. You have many architectural firms that do have uh, very prominent Jewish architects, but they usually adhere more to um, the site building plan motif instead of Liebskin, who starts with an emotional idea and tries to make it come to life. Now, something we saw in those Holocaust museums before was this very angular notion. And he creates these pieces to represent optimism in architecture. He believes that optimism is not a uniquely Jewish trait, but is something that as Jews, we have to inherently believe that things are going to get better. Because if we don't, then bad things happen. And so he describes this optimism as when you draw a building on a piece of paper, you don't know if it's gonna stand. And so every part of architecture is hoping, hoping that your plan will be okayed, hoping that people will find meaning in it and hoping that it will eventually be built. And without this eternal optimism, Liebeskin says that Jewish architecture would never work. And so this is one of his most optimistic pieces um, because this is in the shape of the golden ratio. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, the golden ratio is one to, um, one to 1.618. And it is this uh, spiral, uh, sometimes it's called a Fibonacci sequence, sometimes it's called the golden ratio, but it's a mathematical uh, calculation of natural perfection. The Greeks used it in uh, their architecture. You can see down here, uh, this is the Parthenon. Uh, the Egyptians used it in their pyramids and art and everything like this. So what Leapskin did for the museum extension is to take um, these panels and continue to <laughs> fold them in the manner of the golden ratio until you got a three-dimensional space. And inside you can see it's very light and bright. Uh, it is difficult because of the lack of angles in here, um, but this building is up and you can actually see it. Uh, the majority of these buildings you'll see are in design or under construction, um, which means that unfortunately they are not ready. So the second element of Liebskin's uh, Jewish sensibility is memory of space, place, and time 
but it's like an accordion, okay? Many of us have places that are special to us and even though that they have changed over time or something has come in or come out, there's still a remnant of that space that we want to keep with us. And these are vectors. Now the vectors are the actual little uh, sculptural pieces uh, there on the ground next to the wall. So this is a very interesting um, project. How many are familiar with the way of St. James as a meditation? Okay. So in Christianity, in medieval Christianity, uh, one of the calls for uh, the Crusades was for Europeans to walk from their homes to major churches. One of the major routes would start in London and go to Spain, and that is called the Way of St. James. And that is a um, path that is still traveled today. People get spiritual meditation from it. The vectors that Leapskind and his group created show the liberation route of Jews out of Europe. And so if you go to one of these sites, you can actually walk the kilometers. The entire um, work is over 3,000 kilometers and they're in different countries, they're in the Netherlands, Spain, Italy, and they show exactly that, the liberation route. And uh, Liebskind is hoping to not only imbue the space with memories of the past, but to bring those of the future to not let them fade away. Which brings us to the uh, last of our previous touchstones, and that is to enliven the past and bring it along to the future. We saw that a lot of Lee Skin's uh, Holocaust museums had this fracturing within the past. And so once again, the Royal Ontario Ontario Museum has a historical facade that Studio Leedskin has come in and built this fractal crystalline structure. Again, built on the golden ratio. And one of the reasons why this building is super optimistic is because it has no right angles and one load bearing wall, which is an architectural wonderment, and I will leave it at that. <laughs> so these were the types of buildings and themes that we saw in our first lecture about lead skin. And so now we're going to go up to the rest of his Jewish sensibilities. Now, if you're interested in listening uh, to the interview where I took a lot of this, uh, the Jewish, uh, Jewish Heritage Museum uh, had an interview with him last year that is on YouTube. And if you're interested, we can probably put that link in um, on the description. So if you want to see that in its entirety, we did watch some of it last time, uh, but for ease of the season, I am not doing any audio recordings this time. <laughs> okay, so this is his first major mark in what we consider to be the new leaf skinned mode. What you saw is his museums and his making an additional addendum space to one that has already been built. These are mostly new and I do apologize um, only because the majority of these from here on out are under construction. So what you see here are uh, images provided by Studio Leapskind and these are part of the portfolio that he showed the various companies that this is what it's gonna look like. Is this what's gonna look like when it is eventually built? I cannot say, but this is the current one. Okay, so one of the things that Liebskin learned in spades on the kibbutz uh, was environmentalism. He did live in the kibbutz at the time where the children lived separately from parents. And so there was very much this mixed use space that was a part of his life, uh, just like the environment, because part of the kibbutz was a agricultural um, benefit to the people as well. And that's something that he feels, especially in this post COVID uh, 
era that people need more green space and that people need these atria and light and that the environment needs as much of our help as we can provide. So this is in Nice, France, this is a train station. Um, like the majority of the pieces that we're going to see, this is a mixed use design structure. So this simultaneously is a hotel, a uh, stadium underneath where people can look out on a plaza. This is so the train station, hotel, um, sports arena, uh, civic spaces. So this is a mixed use space with the main focus being on pedestrian use and to get both halves of the city to be in walkable distance to each other. Now, this is where we can begin to have an interesting conversation or many critics have an interesting conversation because now we get to leaf skin projects that are the multi-billion dollar luxury eco residences, okay? So this is in Chengdu, China, and this city is well known for its uh, waterways, as you can see in the middle. And in this plan, Studio Leafskin is looking to use the water as much as you can. Um, one of the assets of this building is that these pools are used for cooling. Uh, it's called deep water cooling. And so underneath, um, the cooling systems are controlled by the water and the flow of the water. And on top of that, you have these fans on the bottom that create um, shade, but they also can move with the building. This is one of the very new realities of contemporary architecture is actually moving the building in two distinct parts so that this outer wave can actually collect sunlight, solar panels that move with the sun. This will also allow the area to have living plants that will be able to move with the sun and also continuously produce um, oxygen. So this is another very, very upscale uh, green residence. And I do understand that in uh, Asia, East Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, that the humidity is a problem. And so using these large pools for cooling is a very energy efficient way to do it. They also have these wing uh, <coughs> sails, again, to help against the sun. And they have one of my favorite things, which is a green landscape roof. You can see it a little bit at the end there. And what this green landscape <coughs> roof does is it collects rainwater, which is then filtered and then used for public water within the system. And that is a way to be environmentally friendly. Now, believe it or not, these are the more, <coughs> more upscale <laughs> luxury residences at the same area. So the Corals at Keppel Bay is the second line of what people see. And so the front line, AKA the, the main skyline is reflections at Keppel Bay. And what's interesting to me is again, these are residences, hotels, uh, restaurants, bars, but the way that they break up the building once again with kind of that skeletonized structure and leaving open air spaces so that people can easily get from within the building to outside space. All of this green space is also part of the urban design uh, by Studio Leapskin, and these are a part of the amenities, which I also find fascinating that as green architecture becomes more upscale, so does the green um, activities that go with it, such as the manicured hiking paths and golfing and pools. Um, however, everything that I read did constantly relate it to the oppressive heat of the area of Singapore. 
So this is one of my favorite green pieces that he's done, mostly because I love France. Um, but this really takes green walls and a green roof to the next level. This is uh, a building that looks like um, one of those Pillsbury crescent roll cans that you kind of, and then you pop it open. That's what it reminds me of. And so if you have, you know, greenery kind of popping open in, in, in between those spaces. Um, but as you can see, or may not be able to see here as easily, I am very sorry about that. Uh, each of the apartments has its own green walkway. This greenery is not only used to clean up the immediate area, but also to hopefully inspire the rest of the area to reclaim green space. And as you can see, just like in Nice, we are working next to a railroad station, which of course is going to bring in our businesses, our restaurants, our hotels, and some uh, private residences. Which brings us to the logical conclusion, which is a pure plan. Now, as I did mention before uh, the talk started, Leapskin is no stranger to urban design and major urban planning. Um, after the walls fell in Berlin and he moved back, there were various competitions to redesign uh, the famous Plotzes in Berlin, which he did. However, at that point, he was still an academic theoretical architect and none of his urban designs were built in Germany. However, in Italy, whole other point. So I also want you to take note of who is paying for this. Again, this is City Life Spa, and this is City Life Master Plan. And one of the interesting give and takes that we have to contend with, especially in green architecture, is you still need corporate intervention and corporate help. And that's the PwC uh, building. It's uh, PricewaterhouseCooper was um, the main company who sought to oversee it. Now how this building, which is actually in the main picture you can see, um, it's green, but it uses changes in glass technology. You have double painting glass, you have again self dimming glass, you have a lot of those self harvesting modes in play as opposed to replanting green space and really getting people out of their space and into the common green places. Now again, uh, the towers that you see down here uh, are for affordable, certain percentage for affordable housing, certain percentage is for uh, luxury housing. And regardless, he mixed these together so that there's never the stigma of what kind of housing that you have. And one of the things that sets Liebskin apart from other architects is this kind of swirling on an axis you can see that in these towers that they seem kind of leaning and they seem kind of um, turning. And that's because he wants to give everyone an opportunity to have a view. Growing up in Brooklyn, he had uh, tenement housing that either had one window or no windows whatsoever. And so he comes from the generation of working people's housing and he wants that to be as accessible as possible. Which brings us down to community housing. So in addition to ecology, uh, Daniel Lietzian is also very, very impassioned about community and connection. And I want to just take a half a break to go into a brief, 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 um, overview on public housing in America. So in the 1910s and 1920s, public housing was created mostly by uh, workers. These were buildings that were 
easy for them to get to work. And because of that, they were repetitive built, few windows, uh, very little um, you know, natural light, very little ventilation. And these became the basis of the housing projects. And how traditional housing projects you'll see up at this top. They're usually a brownstone. Uh, they're either very repetitive or every other one is somewhat different. A lot of these housing projects in the 80s were torn down to make uh, individual homes, but because they were still built on the old project's foundations, they were still plagued by poor materials, by poor sight, by lack of resources. And so in the 90s and early 2000s, they started building uh, what you see on the lower left. Um, I see these a lot uh, around college campuses. And again, uh, they are mostly Section 8 type housing, which is again, plagued by poor floor plans, poor access, because they have stairs to the front of the houses. Well, not everybody can walk up these stairs, but because you're dealing with site-specific, um, grant-specific requests, most architects just throw up their hands and say, okay, this is what we're gonna do, which is this type down here, which is the newest type of affordable housing, which brings us just back to repetitive floors. And no matter how much you spruce it up, it is what it is. So this is the current building that he is getting uh, the most attention for. This is the atrium at Sumner in Brooklyn. This is uh, built with the resources of self-help community, Risebro and Urban Builders Collab. This is also in collaboration uh, with the New York Department of Housing. And so anyway, one of the most interesting things about this is that this is low income and senior housing. And he has designed these spaces so that once again, you are getting a unique site from every single angle. You have the atrium that um, wants to encourage conversation. There's a minimum number of floors so that you don't have to rely so much on elevators. But the question that I have, well, I'll wait till that. Uh, and then we have Midtown West in Detroit. Now this was a site that was an old uh, dilapidated part of the, the city that basically the city turned over and said, we want to do something with this. This is the design. Again, it is in design. But this is still another one of these multi-mix buildings. This, as you can see at the bottom, you have uh, restaurants, you have shopping, and then above is your affordable housing again with this green roof. And this one is also, um, this one is also targeted towards seniors and low income housing again, to try to get everyone to come out of their spaces to um, connect on different levels and stop making things so divided among the community. And this is, uh, this is Sapphire in Berlin. This is an active structure uh, again. You know, a lot of these Leapskin buildings, you're seeing the same core pieces. You have this exterior paneling that either has a uh, environmental purpose, like these panels here are actually collecting sunlight. Um, that's why they look a little bit odd. This design of allowing the building to be a part of the space, but not making it so um, so solid that you can't see through it. And that's one of the interesting choices that you see in the buildings here through the windows is that they allow uh, the site to be reflected, which Leafskin always finds to be very important 
because he doesn't want his buildings to exist alone in a singular space. He wants them to be part of their community, a part of their environment. So whenever Abel, he uh, chooses these very reflective lights so that people, uh, sorry, these windows so that people can see uh, themselves and their surrounding city. Okay, finally, this one. So this is under construction. This is the Freeport Senior Housing on Long Island. And this is the conversation that I wanted to have with a lot of you because um, both Laura and I are very familiar with senior housing. Uh, we've both worked uh, in nursing homes, continuing care facilities, and we have both been carers for various members of family. And so senior architecture is something that we're very familiar with. And what is interesting about these buildings is that they are promoted and celebrated as being designed by a star architect, such as Daniel Liebskin. But they're very loose on the amenities that would be inside. So this one shows that it would have parking underneath, parking underneath in the bays, not only in the site, but underneath. So that's thing number one, is parking. You have your atrium, you have your very geometric shell with an almost interior, a green roof, and a space up top for public and private use. You can see how there's you know, a little sitting area over there and a couple over there, and you can use this green space. Now, my question, very honestly, is now that you have seen this aesthetic and you have seen how he weaves his buildings into the fabric of the community, my question is, are these places where you would want to live? Because I understand the ongoing discussion is that people want to live within their community. They don't want to be forced out. They don't want to be sequestered. But would living in a place like this be visually sequestering? Or do you think that something new and modern would encourage you to get out more? I'm, I'm honestly very curious because I can see in one way how this building would work. It would keep people in their homes. It would keep staff close by, but I really worry about this roof design. Would it be safe? Would it be wanted? What's, what's, what's the purpose? So the purpose of the green roof is multifold. One, uh, it, it, it offloads some of the carbon footprint. So you're gonna uh, invite more oxygen into the area. You're also going to invite biodiversity, such as bees. It's also a place where you can have flowers. Uh, birds will be there, some small animals. And as well as you can collect rainwater, which then will help offset uh, some of the water costs. And uh, also using the atrium, uh, you can fill with solar lights. And so it's a lot of ways to kind of sop up environmental benefits on a, on a small footprint. Yeah, yeah I, I think also a big part of uh, a, a big issue is water runoff, uh, yeah. impervious surfaces. All of those macadam surfaces just run into the storm system, and a roof like that, you know, is much more absorbent and, and consequently, I think, much more positive. It, it's also a lot cooler. Um, I've experienced a lot of these spaces uh, on Penn State main campus, especially the architecture building. Uh, it, it, it's a Leeds green building. And uh, the green roof actually makes things a lot cooler inside. And it also gives you something fun to look at when you're bored. One of the big things is what's different, especially if this is low-income housing, is what kind of budget is going to be there to maintain it. And, you know, for instance, a big problem that 
think you've talked about, and we know that from visiting Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, is that they leap, you know, they're too beautiful. There are all kinds of interesting angles and all kinds of new and beautiful concepts, and they don't function that well. You have to spend a ton of money fixing. Mm -hmm. So with this or with some of his other buildings, you just wonder, you know, how will they hold up? Yes. Uh, which again is an issue with housing just in general and that also goes into some of the internal design uh, he is he does do internal design but with these uh, new sustainable materials such as newspaper lumber where you take newspaper and then you compress it to the point that you can um, make it into small planks and cut it but because newspaper has a fragility to it and it has a maximum length height weight you can't build something like this um or things like using cork uh cork is light cork is very absorbent and you don't need to actually harvest the cork trees you just kind of pull off the bark and in about nine years it'll grow back However, as someone who has a lot of experience with cork, insects love cork. That's actually one of the main reasons why I use it on the regular is because my isopods, they eat it. And so again, I am very much for green architecture, but how are you gonna make sure that it stays top of the line and useful? Also, you can see that there's a minimum, uh, there's only four stories to it. There is a fifth one that uh, has the restaurants, the sixth one is the parking garage. And again, this is to better facilitate walking. Now, I hope they also have an elevator because I would be very annoyed if, 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 <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, this is this is Freeport Senior Housing. So every unit here is ADA uh, compliant, and every unit has uh, the VGI and all the different things. Um, and senior housing in architecture is actually one of the more up and coming um, pockets as our generation becomes older, and housing is at a premium. The statistic I keep hearing, and I don't know where they got it from is that 68% of people will live in urban areas by 2050. Thank you. You have the same exact skepticism that I do about that. Um, <laughs> so uh, this affordable housing and senior housing is becoming quite a conversation. Yes. I'm assuming that buildings are safe to, to live in, but most of the ones not necessarily the ones up on the screen but at the moment but they, they, most of them look like they're about to fall over you were talking about at the beginning how oh, they're, they're kind of forward looking and you know but they also they're a little, little i would think especially the seniors a little scary uh, would i want to move into a building that looks like it's about to tumble over especially as as you can see it kind of creeping out around um, there are some amazing pictures of some of these buildings that show the, the street view and it looks like the building is like peeking out around. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm glad that he didn't go to his double uh, facade uh, type of movement here because I agree, while I appreciate the angularity, um, I'm curious to know what the benefit is of that and is that taking up a space or a venue that could have been used elsewhere. Um, I agree, my my father-in-law is 92 and my grandmother is 94. And my grandmother would just look at this building and go, oh no dear, oh just And I can imagine that because if nothing else, would living in such a contemporary piece of architecture be a turnoff for the majority of people? 
I think it depends on the individual. You know, I think it's very interesting as long as it's well constructed. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the construction. <clears throat> That's my big thing. Well, luckily, Leapskin has only done one house. It, yes. I so again, this kind of brings all of his tenets and his beliefs into one form. Uh, this is a building that is in the middle of a private field. It, uh, as the sun turns, the uh, steel turns from a chocolate to a black to a gray, and so it's harmonizing with its environment. You have the very reflective surfaces so that you're feeling a part of it. I like the fact it's 2,000 square feet. Um, and here's the inside, again. This is very Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, this is a building that is designed with all the furniture and everything in, in place. And um, this is in Connecticut. And this image in the middle, that's a shower. And I would not do, <laughs> personally, I wouldn't do well with the lack of doors. That, I don't know about you, there's no door to the bedroom, no door to the shower. You need that door right up here. Yeah. Yeah, lack of door. Like, there's a door to the outside, but there's no door to shower, so I hope you live alone. Or don't mind sharing with everyone. Wet steps. Oh, yes, and you like wet steps? Mmm, in a wet hallway. Is someone living there? Yeah. It's a private home. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> good for them. They wear shower shoes. I bet they do, too. They help them <laughs> and they went to Bed Bath and Beyond and got some of those curtains, you know. <laughs> right. right. Couple quarter million dollar house and ten dollar curtains. Uh, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed seeing some more of Daniel Leapskin's work. Uh, he is one of two architects who have a uniquely Jewish sensibility to them, who are very open about their Jewish sen sensibility. Leafskin has never shied away from embracing the fact that yes, he is a Jewish architect and he takes this job very seriously to continue to tell the stories for not only his people and his family, but to bring everyone else in. And I hope that you enjoyed uh, seeing some of his work. The only other architect, as I said, um, would be someone by the name of Louis Kahn, Louis I. Kahn. Uh, and he did a lot of his work in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and his Jewish sensibility was more of imbuing the actual material with wants and needs and desires. And uh, some of his work used to be in Coatesville. Uh, he did uh, design public housing in Coatesville, uh, but last I knew around 2018, it was destroyed because of, um, you know, poor use because he used concrete and, you know, all these... No, in uh, Coatesville. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. He's he's done a lot. Uh, and he was a, a Philadelphia architect mostly, so a lot of his works uh, are nearby. He also did the uh, Indian uh, Parliament building. So... But he's, he's another one who I feel that uh, is a uh, kindred spirit with Leap Skip. So thank you very, very much. And I hope you like.